love and magic. When I put these two ideas together, love and magic, it conjures up images of Luciferian conclaves writhing in sexual exchanges, hell-bent literally on bringing into manifestation their deepest desires, in the belief that sexual energies activate latent powers of creation under some battle cry of love is all there is. While all of that may be true on some depraved level, it seems to me more a matter of attempting to abuse a sexualized form of love with the intent to control circumstances and people. And we all know what happens when we try to control everything. God laughs. This is because it isn't about control. We get led down this path of misunderstanding by being taught that we must work hard with our bodies and minds to achieve what we desire. And if we don't do this, we can never achieve anything greater. Marianne Williamson, in one of her lectures on A Course in Miracles, makes the point that when we use our minds to manifest our desires, it's called magic. But when we choose the reality we desire from a space of love, it is following God's will. This is because God is experienced as love, whereas using the mind for manifestation is like using God as an errand boy. This can be a tricky distinction especially when we are constantly besieged with such concepts as the Think and Grow Rich Manifesto so popular these days amongst the magically misinformed. The tendency is to want to apply personal willpower in the actualization of our dreams and desires because we start out from the assumption that we have no claim on what we want and must take it from the universe. This is typical slave thinking and is hardwired into our nervous systems in a matrix of permissions, low self-esteem, and people-pleasing, the type of mental-emotional construct so coveted and encouraged by the dark controllers. The reality of this construct is that what we think we are conjuring up is actually what has already been created, and by simply choosing that reality by living in it, we cross the various thresholds and portals leading to its appearance. By accepting this, we come to the realization that the heaven we seek is already laid out in its fullness and totality within us, and the journey to it describes our resistance. By embracing those resistances rather than fighting against them, we not only discover hidden realms of joy and ease, but we broadcast that loving embrace to the world at large and add to the morphogenic field created by everyone else lovingly embracing their imperfections or resistances. To me, this is the work. This journey through resistance to heaven can seem like we're incessantly trudging toward a utopian horizon that continually remains off in the distance. And yet, by embracing the trudging, Embracing that far-off horizon, we begin to see the not having of it and the having of it as one dramatic scene wherein we play the parts of who we are not as we become who and what we truly are. By following the loving embrace, our path becomes clear, obstacles come and go, and we are enriched through the process. This is because all of creation emanates from and within a divine space of love. And with this viewpoint, it is simple to see the evil in the world as just another way that heaven is being hidden in order to be found. Darkness and evil are constructs of resistance, and resistance is ultimately futile, as all things are returning to or exalting in love. The temporary thrill of control that feeds those of the dark forces simply obscures the eternal background of love that eventually and inexorably erodes the dark resistance and exposes that control thrill as an orgasm of defiance destined to fall before the infinite power of universal love. We all have that thrill of defiance which drives all resistance. Our work is to identify what thrill or reward we are getting by resisting love, the very core of our being. What is the agenda at play causing our experience of suffering, unhappiness, insecurity, dis-ease, and unease in our journey? 
Is this not the self-serving machinations of an ego desperately asserting its validity as a creator? Isn't this kind of creating really just the thrill of defiance against that perfection already created? Is this sort of futile posturing superior to simply choosing that loving embrace that leads to heaven? Right now, let's give that loving embrace to all the petty conflicts, the harsh judgments, the fears and worries that have defined our journey so far, and surrender our feisty, puny wills to the ultimate will that created our highest and best selves we are destined to be. You have been listening to This Quantum Life by Boyd Martin, brought to you by the Quantum Health Newsletter from Pure Energy Rx, www.pureenergyrx.com.